Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another, possibly one of the best, I know I say that a lot, but but real shit, uh, we're on a motherfucking road, excuse my language, it's your boy Chingo Bling, we got producer Rob up, in everyone? the building, a lot of people have been asking for Rob, man, I think it's the voice, Yeah, they just, they just scooped me to the side, like I'm chopped liver, I thought Rob was going to be here, lady, put away your sign. Uh, but send it to me on uh, Instagram at RobGTV. <laughs> hey, there you go. Uh, Freedom of Speech Tour, man. We're off to a great start. Next stop, Phoenix, Arizona, July 25th. I'll be at Stand Up Live, live, live. San Jose, California. Not California, bro. I don't know hey. what you're thinking over there. San Jose, shout out to the whole Bay Area. August 18th, I'll see you there. Denver, Colorado, August 27th through the 29th. All my patriots in El Paso, I'll see you September 9th through the 11th. Brea Califas. It is uh, September 15th. Oxnard, you know, some, some always gets pushed back over there. Oxnard is going to be September 16th. Addison, October 7th through the 10th. San Antonio, October 14th through the 16th. And then Irvine got pushed back to uh, November 3rd. And then we end the tour, Houston, November 5th through the 7th. Get your tickets now, chingobling.com, VIP, you know, chop it up after the show. Um, you get a ton of laughs. It's a ton of laughs. And you need that, man. Dude, I saw people saying, best show I've seen yeah. in a decade. It was amazing. I'm best like, show. damn, I'm mm-hmm. missing out. I'm waiting for the Houston shows. Yeah, man. On, especially a lot of those comments were from Ontario. Shout out to Darren Carter and Jerry Garcia who uh, held it down. Uh, but yeah, all the, all the cities are great. All the comics we roll with are great. I just roll with people that are funnier than me and better than me. That just lets me know where I'm at. And, you know, iron sharpens iron, brother. That's from the Bible. That's true. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, but yeah, those are the tour dates, you know, because I'm employed. You know, I'm trying to get that shmoney. I'm trying to bounce back from that 2020. 2020 kick my ass. But we are back at it. And huge shout out to all the patrons, man. For all of you who have signed up, patreon.com forward slash red pill tamales. It is a, a subscription based business model. It's how we get to continue to freely express ourselves talk about the important issues whether that's the economy immigration elections uh any type of pandemic that's going on i feel that you know we're covering some blind spots where the mainstream media is not and the only way we can do it is with your help where do they go rob patreon.com forward slash red pill tamales and download the app i still get people on the regular basis because we do get people that sign up daily hey man i didn't know about the app or i'm still new to it i get it all the time that's okay just download it uh get familiar with it maybe look up a youtube video or two and join the conversation because chingo interacts in there he answers uh, dms like questions when he can because you know like you're on the road so i know we have a lot of uh, messages for you to still get get to uh but yeah that's the place to go that's where you get all the content all the text posts all the questions all the videos all the audio you can listen to within there or your favorite podcast app even special invites such as yeah uh every what is it the last thursday of every month i think that's what we're gonna do we're just gonna play by ear for this first one we're gonna do the live uh basically live we're Patrons are going to hop in the Zoom with us to have a podcast, pop open a you know a beverage, maybe heat up some tamales, just depending on Mighty Soul. Because she just said like when you're out of town this weekend, the baby might come. She keeps saying that, but I don't know if that's true. Like that could happen. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. It's getting close to due date. Yeah, but I think she's going to hang in there. Yeah. So, but we'll play it by ear and give the patrons a couple of days notice before we hop on a live Zoom with everybody. Mm-hmm. And I did a private movie screening, and I invited all the patrons first on the app, and like Rob said. Not all the patrons live in Houston. Not yep. all the patrons know how to work the app. But once we reach our goal of 2,000 patrons by the end of this year, I mean, it's already grown tremendously. We've been running our mouth every week for the past six months. Yeah. Um, finally getting out on the road. So I finally get the, the first hand feedback of like in person, like, yo, bro, don't stop. Where's Rob? You know, love the episodes. Keep it going. You're doing important work. Hi, so, Dr. Fauci. Hi, Dr. Fauci. That's like the code to uh, get 10% off at the merch <laughs> table. But uh, anyway, uh, we we really appreciate you guys. You guys are the most important part of this whole operation. Otherwise, we're just two deplatformed dudes <laughs> who are self-censoring. Um, and we don't want that. So join the TIA, the Tamal Intelligence Agency, at patreon.com forward slash red pill tamales. Sass. So I'm looking forward to that um, the the Zoom room because my tamal olla. I went and brought it back from storage and because they're big as hell. And I have some uncooked frozen uh, rajas con queso tamales. And I'm gonna whip the motherfuckers up. You know what I'm saying? The tamale kingpin, the king of spices. 
Yo, Dawn literally asked me. Do, she also some? had a tamales left okay. from the event. Well, let me um, let me get a pot going. Uh, I could probably. I don't know if you're gonna hang out because it might take a little while since they're frozen. I'm gonna be back tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Worst case, I have them for you, hot and fresh. Tomorrow. Badass. Um. Mm. Yeah. Whichever ones you have, those or any of the ones you made, they were on point. Yeah. Shout out to my mother-in-law and hell, even Luis. I pitched in, so you know there was no way we could fail. I mean, no shit. These tamales went hard. They did. With that much, you know, help, that, that much uh, yeah, authentic just, help. Yeah, because uh, my mother-in-law brought a cabeza de puerco, a whole pig head, bro, from over there, I think, by like Reynosa. She brought some freshly ground up corn for the masa. I mean, it was off the chain. It was off the chain. We killed it. Uh, not to get too off subject real quick, mm-hmm. just for this intro, are you thinking about doing that anytime soon in the future? Maybe around the holiday time? Um, yeah, man. I'd love to. I'd love to. I don't want to miss out on tamal season this year. Plus, we might be on lockdown again. God knows for what. Maybe climate this time. <laughs> we'll have to do a curbside somewhere. Yeah, so it, fuck <laughs> that. The The pandemic caught me slipping the first time. Not again. Not again. Uh, very excited about this episode, man. You know, we have, if you follow him, his name is Jorge Ventura. Doing amazing work. He's out there, boots on the ground. He, it's almost like he's on a journalist tour because he might be in Del Rio one day, uh, McAllen the next day. Now he's at an event in Florida. Uh, very important. He works with uh, The Daily Caller. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's been featured on, I think, everywhere from uh, Steve Bannon's War Room Pandemic to Fox News. Yep. All over the place representing uh, Latinos. And I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he's on the right. He will. He did say, and he'll, he'll talk about it. He's, he tries to be as center. Neutral. Yeah, okay. holding everybody, both sides, feet to the that's fire. That's good. And that's his words. And we kind of talk about all that. No, that's great. Yeah. So without further ado, man, buckle up, put your seatbelt on. Uh, we talk about a lot of stuff, man. Everything from what he saw firsthand, uh, immigration, I mean, the border issue. Also, how people back home in California, how they started to wake up and look at everything. So a lot of really good information a lot of clips so if you have not subscribed to the youtube clips will be up spread them around so we can grow the podcast all right without further ado here we are jorge ventura ladies and gentlemen welcome back welcome back rpt red pill tamales season number six this is the finale y'all episode number 72 and the best part of this show is you guys man the audience spreading the word we have producer rob in the building what's up everyone and we have a very special guest um you know, I once tweeted, Jorge Ventura greater than Jorge Ramos. <laughs> so if we could just swap out Jorge Ramos completely because Jorge Ventura is doing more journalistic work than half of you clowns up there in the mainstream media. More. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jorge Ventura. Yeah. I'm excited to be here, man. I'm really excited. Yeah, man. You, you represent the Latino heat. Yeah, see, sir. So right here, man, it's uh, my boy, Eddie Guerrero's. I was paying some tribute to him. I'm at, a, I'm at a political conference. I'm like, you know what? What's a better way? Um, damn, let, me, say, let, me, let, me, let me cut that real quick. No, get it. Go for it. Crazy. Yeah, That's yeah. how you know you're doing work. When you got, you know, your phone's ringing. When you're in a hotel room, and as soon as you log on to Chit Chat with Red Pill Tamales, the feds get to call Yeah, the CIA calls and says, hey, uh, I'm going to have to have, to talk, have a talk with you. Yeah, man. So, um, do you know who Latino Heat is, right? Eddie uh, Guerrero. Were you- I, I wasn't into wrestling during that time. Oh. I'm from the old school, man. I, man. I'm back in the uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Totally, totally Co- fair. Co- Coco Beware. I uh, I see you as like a huge Rey Mysterio fan. You know, I was like Ultimate Warrior. That was like know, the that- Iron Sheik. That's good times. Yeah, oh. man. You were you were an oh. infant. I was. Yeah, I was totally oh. an infant. He's on. He's definitely on the call. We'll try okay, to talk we're seeing, over. We're seeing the, uh, we're seeing the, the Stasi. <laughs> uh, we're seeing the brown shirts coming to uh, snatch up Jorge right now, dude. Live, live on live stream. My God, can you imagine straight out of. Cuba. Hey man, I thought they were coming for you because you were a dissident. Yeah. <laughs> no, my bad, fellas. All right. So, so where are you right now, man? So right now I'm in I'm in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida, for the uh, uh, you know Turning Point has their conference. Uh, SAS. So. For me as a reporter, I don't like I don't cover this type of stuff, but I like to go and still mingle. Like I, I like to know where the voters like what their thoughts on what issues they care about. So me, I like to just see where what what do these people care about? What does the base you know care about right now? And it's a it's a good chance to see how voters are feeling on, on certain issues. How long have you been into uh, like really involved in the political system and everything? So for me, Chingo, I think two or three years ago. I hopped into this political journalism. So, so, so for those who don't know, like I went to a community college. I was majoring in 
in sports journalism. So originally, man, I wanted to just be a sports reporter. I was the biggest Lakers and Raiders fan that you could find. You know, that was my big dream, you know, ESPN, Fox Sports, all that stuff. So I was on that route. I, I even did an internship with, with Tele... Sound like he was going to say Telemundo. I think so. Damn, it froze. Is that us? No, it's definitely the Wi-Fi. Jorge! Like on his end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like he like froze, froze. A la madre. I'm telling you, man. They got him, bro. <laughs> we got to remember he was talking about he did an internship. I feel like he was in Say Telemundo. Yeah. No, but está cabrón. Look, why y'all at it, man? Why y'all listening right now? Hop on social media. Hop on Jorge Ventura TV. That's his page. Make sure y'all give him a follow. He's out there in Tampa Bay right now. Um, I wanted to go to that Turning Point event. The last Turning Point event I went to was amazing. But... um. But yeah, man, I'm really excited to, as soon as we get the Wi-Fi situation, to talk about all the stuff. Bro, he's been like in South Texas for like the whole summer. Who? Uh, uh, Jorge. Oh, yeah, because he's yeah. been reporting on the border. Just Uvalde, Del Rio, McAllen. Um, he's literally on the ground. He was interviewing uh, the gentleman, uh, Mike, from, uh, what is it, Warriors for Ranchers? Yeah. Um, just getting the firsthand scoop that you don't see on the mainstream media. A lot of those clips that went viral of like Venezuelan migrants or people from Honduras, Guatemala, um, interviewing the like the polleros or coyotes, like talking to them, saying, "Yeah, is business booming? Yes, you know what I'm saying. Um, is it because of Biden? Yes, you know it's time to get it. Yeah, he was literally like he he was boots on the ground." I mean, you went on that that same kind of uh, area. You went in that same area when you went on that boat, right? Mm-hmm. Did yeah, you, it probably was. Did some... you see that many people when you went? I saw a ton of people. It was just, it was like Grand Central Station. It was just raft after raft after raft after raft. And I really want to ask him like some of the statistics because, you know, he gets to hear firsthand people from Del Rio that are fed up, that are like, there's high speed chases now in our little bitty town. Um property owners people like women that live alone or something you got people going up in there just to use their hot water like take a shower go up in their fridge damn a lot of these uh viral moments like the um the dps the texas highway patrol Mm -hmm. lady uh assisting holding an infant like that was stuff that he he captured um the elderly venezuelan woman that was like carried like on someone's shoulder Mm -hmm. that was footage that he captured um he's doing great work really important stuff um you know j- just like all the guests that we're having right now man just like jonathan on the last episode so um I, you know people this is a crazy thing man a lot of chicanos and americans or leftists or even people on the right there's just so many crises happening right now that i almost feel like people have not moved on from the border crisis but just kind of checked out yeah there's just so much happening like somebody left me a comment one time like oh all of a sudden you care about crt and i hear you post about this this and that now you care more about cuba than you care about this it's like first of all bro you don't know what i believe what i think you know stop mind reading and two you know the only reason i jumped on the crt thing for example is because I saw it was getting even more mainstream. Like, you got John Leguizamo talking about it now? All right, bet. Bet. We finna counter this shit. So. Um, Think on his back. Okay. Okay, good. You good, brother? Hello, hello? Yo, what? they trying to stop us, bro. Dude, legit. <laughs> hey, they can't silence us all, brother. I know Jen Saki over there trying to make us part of the, her disinformation dozen. Oh, we're joking about it. But I think they were trying to censor you on the spot. But you were saying, man, yeah, you, yeah. you had an internship. Were you about to say Telemundo? Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know how, sh- how should we do it, Rob. Should you want to ask it again and I kind of go in or, or just kind of keep going? No, we, we kept going. Yeah, yeah. So you were talking. You were telling us about how you started from the sports journalism and then you actually had an internship and that's when it cut off. Yeah, so I did an internship with, with Telemundo. I was working close with the LA Rams. Um, this was around 2017-ish, 2018. But I could already tell... After 2016, I mean, as you guys know, the, the whole game changed after 2016. I mean, media, politics, news, it just like it was it was in your face all the time. I was always I always caught myself reading reading political news. And and, and I was the guy, man, that I would I would hate on politics. I, I didn't even know what a Democrat or a Republican was. I was hmm. I was literally just a sports guy. But but after the election, I was intrigued. And the reason why was because when I would talk to my friends on the right, they would say, hey, man, Trump didn't get a fair share with the media. 
we really don't trust the media. And then also when I would talk to my friends on the left who were like Bernie Sanders supporters, they also felt that the mainstream media didn't give him a fair share too. Hmm. So for me, I was like, you know what? I never voted before. I'm not a, really a political guy. I could probably get into this reporting now and be that voice down the middle. You know, I could be that guy to hold both uh, political parties feet, uh, you know, hold them both, both accountable. Cause in my journalism class, they taught us that like back in the seventies and eighties, bro, the reporters wouldn't even vote. You know, if they, if they, if they're reporting on politics, they wouldn't even vote. Like it was, it was kind of like this unwritten rule. So for me, I'm like, you know, you know what? I never voted before. Let me be the a new voice. So I jumped in there, bro, like 20, 2018. And this, this is where we are now. How old are you for context? I'm 26, bro. Okay. Super young. Yeah. Young brother. Shit. Yeah, man. So yeah, ju- just, just jumped there, man. Took a, like I said, it t- took a huge risk. There's also not a lot, a lot of like Latinos, reporters in this space either Mm -hmm. so you know there's this is kind of a a whole new lane and um you know i'm really glad that people are really getting you know connected to the content and they love that whether you're republican or democrat we're gonna we're gonna hold you accountable yeah that's great and uh, i was saying uh when you're fixing your your uh, wi-fi issue working around the feds (laughs) it's the just like the 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 importance of how you're shining a light. Um, it was your viral footage of the uh, the Texas Highway Patrol lady assisting with the infant. It was your footage of the, um, you know, the elderly Venezuelan woman, you know, on someone's shoulder and, and talking firsthand to the coyotes and the polleros. Like, is business booming? Is it because of Biden and things like that? Um, some really important stories. I told everybody to follow you. So you were in the Rio Grande Valley in, in South Texas for a minute, right? Yeah, man. So I, I hit I hit that South Texas for the for my first time in March. And from there, I've been in like the uh, Del Rio. We spent a lot of time in like the McAllen area and kind of all I mean, all around. And I was really shocked. You know, one thing in the news, man, is a lot of things in the news are like overhyped. So what I mean by that is like it'll be overhyped in the news. And then when I get there in person, you'll be like, oh, OK, it's really like not that crazy. This was actually one of the times it was the opposite because you, you when you when you're reading about the border crisis it's, it's just like stats you know you can't you can't see it but when you're there in person and you're like yo these are real people these are human beings I think on, on my on like my very first time on the ground in McAllen I was only on the ground for like an hour or two and we ran into a group of 300 migrants and you know we're, we're meeting kids who are like we asked them like hey where's your mom and dad they're like they're back in El Salvador they're back in uh, Honduras. Some of them, some of them have actually got kidnapped on the way. A lot of these cartels were using for sex traffic, wow. sex traffic, or human traffic. And I actually talked to a woman from El Salvador who told me that her they kidnapped her husband and that he was still in a stash out in Mexico while she was being apprehended in McAllen. So you hear these stories, and uh, wow. for me, like I, I'm actually trying to tell people, I'm like for me, it's not even a border crisis; it's actually a humanitarian crisis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of Americans, when they think humanitarian crisis, they think, oh, well, that can't happen here. It's in Africa. It's in Yemen. It doesn't happen on U.S. soil, but it's like it's it's happening here uh, on U.S. soil. And uh, for me, I, I don't know what the political gain is of not solving this issue. I really don't understand it. So it's 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 insane, man. But yeah, we're trying to we're trying to shine as much light as we can. I think one of the more viral videos, I think you saw two chingos when I was covering, um, I forgot, I was in the Del Rio area and you had all these Venezuelans coming through the water and the kids. And that's that, that's when I caught that, that it was a really, for me, it was a beautiful moment to see the Texas State Trooper with the baby mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and caring for the baby. And at the, after the, the Texas State Trooper told me, she said, hey, what am I supposed to do? Like, at the end of the day, these people are humans, man. Like, yeah. I'm, you know, we don't want to, we don't want them to drown. It's a, it's a horrible situation what's happening to our people, man. Yeah. And the mainstream media is not doing us any favors. Uh, the way they frame things, um, especially like folks on the left, you could just, you just look at it like, okay, why are you not okay with Cubans who are escaping communism coming over here? You're very vocal about y'all need to stay home. But when it comes to people from Central America, et cetera, it's like, no, we, we were able to absorb everybody. And then this charade thing with the, uh, the kids and the camps and renaming the camps and the, sh- you know, moving people around throughout the country. Uh, what, what is some of the most, um, I guess, for people that are listening, if they're not up on game in terms of all the different stories, could you pinpoint one story in particular where you feel would really like just show the, the humanitarian you know, crisis. Yeah, that. I think, I, well, for me, it's just, you know, I think being on the ground covering the border and just speaking to like locals in Texas and obviously migrants, the, the big thing right now is that the Mexican cartels and these human smuggling groups are really just banking it in. You know, they're making up to $14 million a day. And what they do along the border on the Mexican side is they have all these homes where they stash these migrants. So for me, I always thought, okay, 
uh, migrants getting stashed. That only happens on the Mexican side. Little did I know when I started reporting in Texas, I met a I met a, a priest who like owns these three uh, three uh, three apartment units, and the priest and and uh, and 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 the and, and the the priest told me that his that that his properties were actually being used as stash houses by the cartels. So man, it sounds like you in a stash house right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we got to try to like trap. smuggle me out of this hotel room, man. But uh, no. So one thing he told me, he said, "Hey, I rented out these properties, bro." And then like three months later, he says, "He says, hey, I got a call from my neighbors saying there's like 40 people living in my home." And so he went to go check up on it, and boom, each apartment had like 50 people. He had kids, like all hungry and like the, the living conditions are horrible. I mean, this is a small apartment with like one, one bathroom. And the only reason that he was able to find out is because some of the migrants escaped the stash houses and were knocking on the neighbor's doors for food. Damn. I mean, it's crazy. Cause it's like, you don't think this happens on, on us soil, but it's, it's happening at a, at a rapid pace. I was just also interviewing a Texas rancher that has been shot at on his own property. And he actually gave me a call last week that um, the cartels, or what he's assuming it's some migrants, actually broke into his property and stole firearms. So now he's oh. paranoid because of the situation. But this is a this is a reality. I mean, a lot of people in Texas they they know if you're a Texas rancher, you got migrants breaking in, you got them stealing. It's 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 a safety issue. But for me, um, like I said, I, I think if if I could pinpoint one, I think for me it's it was that day, man, when I was covering in Del Rio with the Venezuelans crossing because. You could see it in the Venezuelans that when they reached U.S. soil, just how grateful they were. They were kissing the dirt. They were they were just ecstatic to be here. In that moment with the Texas State Trooper and the baby, it just kind of showed more of the of of the human side of this whole thing that's going on. And, and you know what, man? I posted that on my social media, and I was I was basically saying these people are so grateful, unlike a lot of Americans, that they're kissing the soil now that they've arrived. And I got so much pushback, and I understand. They might think, oh, Chingo, you're mind reading. You don't know why they're kissing the ground. I can only speculate. But I got so much pushback. People are like, oh, it's because they almost died and they went through a really rough time. That's why. Not because this country's great. And, and just stuff like that. And I'm thinking like these little Marxists have gotten so brainwashed that they, they pushing back on me. And what I'm saying, like, bro, it's obvious. Like, did they kiss every ground of every country along the way? Or is this the final destination for freedom? Yeah, it's, it's, it's for sure. I mean, we're still the beautiful thing about it, man, is the United States is still like a beacon of hope, you know, for a lot of people. And even when I was speaking to the to the Venezuelans there, man, they were I was like, hey, man, just kind of, you know, tell me about what, what's what's happening. And they're like, you know, Venezuela is becoming impossible to live in. And then what they told me, they, the, the one of the Venezuelans said, hey, everyone that you see crossing right now. This is middle class, meaning we were able to do this journey because we sold our last house or we sold our cars. Like we basically sold everything. And we're here. The people that can escape Venezuela Stop. are the very, very lower class that I mean, are literally eating breadcrumbs and stuff like that. There's a great story. There's a documentary, guys, in Venezuela where there's there's a lot of kids in Venezuela that like live on their own, like groups of like 16 year olds who don't have parents, like just fend for themselves on the streets. And it's a horrible situation. And. I mean, at the end of the day, like, obviously, there's, there's still a lot of bad things going on on this country. Like, we, you know, we're fighting through a lot of, like, censorship and other issues. But we are, we're still a beacon of hope for a lot of people. And, you know, see, seeing, the, seeing, like, the fight in the Venezuelan people actually made me have much more respect for them. And the way that they loved, the, the, like, you know, like I said, they were kissing the soil. It was funny because I posted that video and a, a bunch of my comments said, hey, can we trade in these Venezuelans with, like, all those white kids yeah. that live in Portland and Seattle? <laughs> can, we do, like, a, can we do, like, a trade-off? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Well, dude, being that you're so young, you're 26 years old, right? And you wanted to be a sports reporter. And now you're covering this type of, of content and this type of, you know, political climate. What is your motivator and what what is your mission statement as an independent reporter, or as a reporter? I think for, for me, it's just that, you know, more, more than ever, and, and the, the stats already came out, more than ever, people do not trust media at all. So for me, it's almost like, I want to get it back to a level where people trust media, they trust the news, or they also feel that the person who is reporting the news, that they care about the same issues that affect you. So one of the biggest problems that actually that I learned, uh, Rob, during this during this process is when I joined the Daily Caller last year and I went to Washington, D.C., and I was in D.C., I figured out, well, I figured out, OK, I know why the news people here don't even cover the issues that affect Americans, because you guys are, are living in your D.C. bubble. All of your friends are rich. All your family members, they're, they're good. Everyone, everyone in that D.C. bubble is great. So when the pandemic came, they loved it. They got wine, wine to the house, food to the house. 
they didn't realize the everyday Americans that were like losing their businesses. In DC, there were the steakhouses, you can still get a steak. But while here in Cali- in, in my home state of California, we're telling restaurants they can do indoor, outdoor. So, so for me, man, is it's, uh, it's, it's learning a lot. So when I, what, what I'm trying to say is when I got into that DC bubble, I said, you know what, for me, as a kid from a community college, I didn't go to a big university like everyone in DC. Like anyone who made it in DC went to a big university. Their mom and dad went to a big university. I'm coming from a community college. My dad is on a sixth grade education. So I'm I'm very I coming from a really working class background. So for me, it's it's is is forcing this this the mainstream media, the corporate media, to talk about the issues that are impacting everyday Americans on the ground. So one thing that I covered covered a lot in the beginning of this year is when um in California is I made a mini documentary on the restaurant industry because they were all going out. I mean, so many restaurants in California went out of business. So many families lost everything, their dreams. As we, I was doing those interviews, they were te- the 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 servers were like, hey man. Um, not only did I basically lose my job because there's no indoor out outdoor no more, it's takeout only, but my wife, who's also a server, lost her job. So now you have two parents bringing mm-hmm. no income into the home. Not only that, they get to the home and they got the, they got these they got kids who are now uh, um, falling into depression and are suicidal because they're stuck looking at a screen for seven hours a day. And if, if they want to go play outside, we, we you have people yelling at them to like you know wear a mask and stay six feet away. So. For me, it's like all these issues just weren't getting, you know, broadcast and re- reported on. So for me, it's it's I'm really passionate, man. Just just obviously getting it's the basic guys like, oh, getting the truth out. But it's just like telling those real stories on the ground, man, and giving those people hope. Because the, a beautiful thing about this, man, is like after I was doing my interview interviews with the restaurant owners, after each interview, they would sit down and be like, hey, Jorge, like r- for real. Thank you for listening to me, man. And like mm. telling our story like this actually means a lot. We can't believe we've been ignored by all the media, local media. And, and the thing is. Around that time, it was like, oh, if we if you want to open a restaurant, people point the finger at them like, oh, my God, these guys want to kill our grandma with COVID. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, these guys are fighting to survive while big business and all of them got bailed out. These guys didn't get bailed out. Who's fighting for them? I was interviewing um, a, 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 a hair salon owner who had her close her doors on Valentine's Day. And she and, and, and before our, our final interview, she went to a Walmart. And the, the nail salon and hair salon in the Walmart was open, mm. but hers wasn't open. And she took a picture. She, she sent me to it. and She was crying. She says, why is this state like crushing my dreams? So for me, it's like I want to highlight that stuff. And then the, 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 the good thing is right now is our stories are so powerful that they're actually making it to the mainstream media. They're making it on Fox News. We're forcing them to talk about what's going on, on the ground, man. And then, you know, being Latino, man, I, I also want to focus on issues that are obviously affecting our people and be a new voice for our people. And hopefully, man, with my journey, we could get more Latinos to be like, you know what? Look at that kid, man. He went to a community college. He didn't go to Yale like these other guys. And he made it into D.C. Yeah. I'm a hustle. Yeah. I'm going to get into D.C. too. And we can hopefully change the culture, bro. We need to make that shirt, though. The Jorge Ramos and Jorge Ventura <laughs> greater than. That's a legit shirt. Man, th- wait, your rant right now, that's a clip. Yeah. That's going to be a clip. So... With everything that we see happening with uh, certain states and, you know, the lockdowns, like everything you described, you know, what they're putting people through over a virus, right? That's what, that's, that was the, for your safety. That was the reason, right? Protect grandma. How do you feel, do you feel that like Latinos in in California or California, as some would say, do you think they get it? Do you think they connect the dots and say, wait a minute, this is getting a little tyrannical and our freedoms are are being, you know, uh, taken away and it's due to the government, or do you think they're all brainwashed and it's like, nah, fools, to keep us safe, homie? No, I actually do think that the, a lot of Californians are, are waking up. The big moment, Chingo, that, that changed everything was when when the lockdowns happened, Gavin Newsom uh, put a ban on indoor dining, right? And then like a week or two later, he went to the French Laundry and was dining indoors, having fancy champagne. And when those photos came out, it actually changed everything in California, because that was the one moment where like people who weren't political or people who were like lifelong Democrats in the state of California, they got it. They woke up. And that's when we saw the recall Newsom movement just gain traction. So right now, um, people are waking up, whether Latino, black, white, Asian. When when, the thing is, when you're hurting people's livelihoods, it gets to a point. They're like, okay, I'm waking up now. What's what, what what's going on? You know, people who are weren't even into politics, you know, people that literally just go to work you know, want to make an honest living, want to, you know, feed their kids. They woke up because because for the first time ever, the government came in and said, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't make a living. Chingo, I was just to get a, a haircut in California, bro, felt like prohibition. My barbers, my barbers had a blackout all the windows. I couldn't call the barbershop because 
because they thought that it could be like a public health department person. I had to like go through the back and I'm like, look at, look at it all. Look at the struggle my guys are going through just to make a living. I mean, this is not anything illegal. So um, yeah, wow. man, I think people are waking up. What's interesting though, uh, Chingo in the state of Texas, South Texas, like McAllen, the real, all those sect that, that sector, which is overwhelmingly Democrat is now headed to the GOP because of, because of the border issue. So they're seeing the, the problem. McAllen just voted new mayor, Javier Villalobos, former GOP chairman. And I, and I asked Javier, when we did an interview, I said, Javier, you know, why do you think the Latinos are, are grasping going more to the GOP? He said, hey, man, when I ran, I'm just talking about family and traditional values. Like, I'm not even really into the whole left, right? We're talking about tradition. We're talking about family. We're trying to put money back into families' pockets. And I think that's what we're seeing. And a big thing, too, right now is that with the Democratic Party, when they, when they, when they push this kind of woke, Latinx, mm. transgender stuff, a lot of people forgot Latinos are more traditional than your like average traditional person. So a lot of Latinos, maybe they not they might not tell you in person because it's you know we we live in this climate. They might not tell you that they don't support same sex marriage, but behind closed doors they still don't. Still a lot of Latinos don't support same sex marriage. So when they see this new woke. Stuff like that, I think that's also that's also pushing a lot of Latinos back to to a tradition. Let's call it what let's call it what it is, man. It's Marxism. Yeah. A lot of this is like culture war, cultural revolution. They're trying to just undo, divide. The, the left is keeping racism on life support. They want to just have us focusing on race. And have you gotten see, your followers might be different than my followers. Um because you know. Everything you just described, they would have been calling me a coconut the whole time. Like, what do you mean? So do you get any pushback? Do people call you a sellout? Because because you are brown, they can't call you a bigot racist. So you got to be a coconut. Do you get any of that Theo Tom stuff? Yeah, I got I got a lot of that, man, during uh, last year when I was covering the Black Lives Matter riots. So when I, I was exposing, hey, like th- this group isn't a peaceful group. They're like beating up reporters, They're, like burning down buildings. When I when I started posting about that. That's when I got like the most hate ever. I got people, people were still calling me a white, people like, you're a white supremacist. I'm oh like, my God. you do know my name is Jorge, right, bro? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> no white supremacist name is, is Jorge. But it was during that time, man, people, people from my, like, that I went to high school with messaged me saying, dog, I thought you were this. I can't believe that you like was sell out to the white I thought you liked like the Raiders. And it's like, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, man. So yeah, it was during the Black Lives Matter, man, time. I got, I got like the most hate. People were calling me all types of stuff coconut all that all that stuff during the black lives matter Dude, go ahead uh i just want to say real quick and hold that thought real quick rob the fact the fact that you were on the ground during the blm riots some people would frame them as protests mostly peaceful. peaceful yeah so the fact that you were countering with facts with evidence with data with truth the propaganda that the mainstream media was doing right it it, it, it must have jolted people out of their seats because it's like, whoa, 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 cognitive dissonance. I, how do I reconcile what I'm seeing on Jorge's page on the ground versus these assholes on mainstream media just showing a burning car in the background saying it's mostly peaceful? Two things. Yeah, I want, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Oh, so a censorship is one thing I wanted to get into with you, but also you mentioned the, because uh, you're ca- from California. I didn't know that you were originally from California, but are you following or reporting? Or is anybody that you're friends with reporting the recall closely? As, as of right now, one one who does a good job, I, I like Fox uh, Fox Eleven, that local channel. They're, they're they've been they've been pretty good, but I'm I'm still following it super close uh, in in California. So I got I got my eye on that. Um, there's a there's a good amount of candidates in right now. I think one of the stronger candidates who could uh, win against Newsom. I just don't know if he, they you know they pick up. But I, uh, there's a California State Assembly member, Kevin Kiley, who's been really good he's actually he was actually going against Newsom even last year when the lockdown stuff was happening he was like actually working in there we got Kevin Falconer who's a former former mayor of San Diego I think he could he could win just because he's already been a former mayor and, and, and it's also about name recognition I know Larry Elder just jumped in and this is not gonna be a popular take with a conservative movement but it's like Larry Elder is popular with conservatives but he's not popular with liberals you're not winning California without getting that liberal vote. So you need somebody that could do that. Larry Elder, for me, doesn't have name recognition. So I see like a Falconer, maybe Kevin Kiley as like the two top dogs that could could, could go against Newsom. One of my theories is that even if Larry Elder doesn't win, that the fact that he's black, he's going to have somewhat of a platform to, to hopefully have some black folk listen to what he has to say without writing him off as a sellout. And it may be... It might still be like a small step 
for like the black conservative movement yeah. or African Americans to start to demand more from the Democratic Party, not just be like, man, we just vote blue. Instead, they might be like, okay, well, there was this Larry Elder guy that he was running and some of the stuff was interesting and now I'm following him. And then you go down this rabbit hole. Mm. Next thing you know, you a Patreon for me, Red Pill Tamales, <laughs> patreon.com. <laughs> forward slash red pill tamales so dude with all the content that you're reporting on how has censorship affected your page so for, so for me man um they'll, they'll what they'll do with me is like they'll shadow ban a lot of stuff you could tell you could tell mm. when, when some of your, your your posts are are hidden so i i face it now i haven't faced it uh to other levels because i know what topics to avoid so it, that's how you know censorship's already working wow because I'm not going to talk about certain things because they're going to come out to my whole my whole page. And I got a lot on I got a lot on the line here, man. And so one thing that like I really don't talk about and I, I can just keep it real with y'all is like I don't talk about the vaccines on my page, bro, because mm. I don't want them to take down my stuff. You just I, said I, it I, on I, my I, podcast. I yeah. Yeah, bro. So I stay away from that stuff, man. And I focus on what I can control, which is I could be on the front lines for y'all. I could show, show you guys real stories and things like that. I, and uh, that's what I do. But but that's how you know, man, like. Like that should even be a factor for me though. That like, but but it's playing a role, bro. I, I don't talk about vaccines. When the election came around and the whole it was stolen or whatever, your boy avoided that one. I was like, nope, I'm not touching that one. I saw I, I saw so many pages go down during that time. So it sucks, man. You're you're. It's like it's it's, it's self censorship. Yeah, it's self censorship from the media, and that's unfortunate. It's yeah, very, and. Yeah. It's funny, man, because like, for instance, there's a lot of reporters that like they covered Jan 6 and all they did was streaming, like not even talk. And some of them were actually left wing. Like they just they just, you know, recorded what happened they posted to YouTube. YouTube would then ban their page, take them down and all this stuff. Yet those same reporters will sell the footage to CNN and MSNBC. They're not getting banned on that CNN and MSNBC. Their, their, their channels continue to get pushed on that YouTube algorithm. Wow. And it's amazing to think that in America, 2021, we're this is like an interesting time to be alive. Like we're witnessing something that we're going to have to tell our kids, like, you know, mijo, it wasn't like that. You know, it never used to be like that. Like the world you're growing in. That's what really scares me, man, is what kind of America, what kind of freedoms um, are my kids going to inherit? What are they going to grow up in? Is it, They're just going to have to go around fighting neo-Marxists all day. You know, yeah, because like, you got to think, Jorge, like he's 10 years older than me and he's like 15 years older than you. Damn, bro, you're going to call me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes, he's seen a thing or two. Hey, I've been around the block. Back in my day, I had to walk to school in the snow. <laughs> with your Walkman. <laughs> yeah, with my disc. And, and another is and a, a, a thing too, Chingo, that I've been thinking about. Obviously, like, I don't have kids now, but I, I have those same thoughts of like, what type of America my kids could grow up in. But at the same time, it's like it's becoming even more impossible, especially in California. It's becoming even more impossible to even raise a family. I mean, the, the cost of living is insane. You know, back in back when my parents from El Salvador came to California, I was just talking to my dad about this. I'm like, Dad, isn't it crazy that you came on a sixth grade education, worked that worked as a trucker, and by the time that my dad was 28, 30, owned a nice middle class home. My mom could stay home with the kids, and it's a beautiful middle class life. You know, we're not the richest people in the world, but you know, if we wanted to go on vacation on the summer, we could do that. That's a that's how like America should be, where the man works. The, the mom stays home. She nurtures the kid. And like that, you have a beautiful system. That system is impossible. Now in California, the man works. The wife probably has two jobs. The kids don't have, uh, they have to pay for a babysitter. So they're not being even raised by the by the mother. And then when these kids are, let's say, they go off to college, right? Let's say Thomas and Daisy, they go to UCLA. They graduate 22, 23 years old. Let's say Tommy, Tommy and Daisy fall in love in college. They graduate. Tom looks at Daisy and says, Hey, babe, I would love to marry you. I want to have kids, but you're you have one hundred thousand uh, dollars in debt from this from this degree. And I'm probably in debt like one forty K. We just have to work our basically our asses off. And and then they put off they put off having kids. They put off buying a home. And it's actually bad for the country. I think our what was our, our like our like our birth, our birth rate in this in this country is like declining massively. Um, less and less of people are able to own a home. So we're we're moving away from that life. And, and a, a, a big issue, too. For that problem is like early, you know, early 2005s, and from there is the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party sold out middle class manufacturing jobs to China. Yep, that was one of the biggest yep. L's yep. this country has ever taken. Is that trade deal? All yep. and that, that NAFTA deal. We shifted so much middle class yep. jobs. I mean, think about this. Back in the day, if you lived in Detroit, your dad could work at the at an auto manufacturing thing. His income was so good that the mom could stay home and he could pay college for his two kids. It was nice. Yep. They took that job away. 
now 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 we're seeing the uh, divorce uh, rate, rate skyrocketed kids are now hooked on opium i mean the whole system bro it's 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 insane it's crumbling fast so you're telling me that the american dream basically america was once great where you can where you bro where you and i we grew up similarly just based on like your dad's able to work and your mom's able to stay home that american dream that ship has sailed because these days it's damn near impossible like you just said for it to be just single income and you're able to buy a house, especially somewhere in California. I mean, God damn, everything's so high. You're getting inflation. You're getting tax from every damn orifice. Uh, this administration, se la están dando caer a todos. So, man, brother, I, 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 I'm just, my blood pressure, man. <laughs> when my blood pressure gets high, brother, because it's like. It turns into Sleepy Joe. You can't so, find so, the word. Yeah, 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 really. So, so this is what Come I'm trying on, to say. Man. Here's what I'm trying to say, man. What you just described, the scenario of you could live in Detroit, the, your dad could work in the automotive industry, it's almost like what Trump was saying, meaning we need to bring back manufacturing. We need to like these countries are taking advantage of us. Basically, we're getting screwed on the trade side. We done shipped off jobs. We need to make it great again. But because of the punk ass mainstream media and these so called fake ass journalists, they were too busy trying to paint him as the next Hitler, Stalin, or somebody. That meanwhile, they turned his message of make America great again into it's racist, it's neo, uh, it's alt right, neo Nazi, blah, blah, blah. Don't look over there. Nothing to see there. And it's like, no, we want what, what Jorge Salvadorian family went through, you know, what a lot of American families, it's like, Single income, yeah. Traditional values. So, since you brought up, you know, you started the the conversation with it. You went into this not necessarily leaning one side or the other, and you know, we, obviously, this is a conservative leaning podcast. And you know, if you say anything positive about Trump, people on the other side will completely attack you. They lose their shit. They completely lose their mind. So, if if we if I were to ask you, leading up to like the twenty twenty election, based off what the candidates were saying. What was your interpretation of what would the best direction the country could have gone? Well, for okay, so for so for me, a, a big part of why Trump won in sixteen is that he woke up that populism worker class movement, and I feel that for the for this for this uh, you know heading into twenty twenty, the thing is what when, when when through everything just obviously haywire was 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 COVID because in twenty sixteen. Yeah. When Trump, when Trump ran, he saw, hey, manufacturing is a huge problem and immigration. And he tied those together to jobs and wages. And he did a beautiful job of, of, of getting that message out. And that's how he brought a lot of people to the Republican Party. Because for the first time, the first time people in America woke up, if you lived in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Detroit, you woke up and said, hey, my family's uh, my family got destroyed by the, the left and the right selling out our, our jobs. For the first time, this guy speaking to me and, and, and as a working class person. So heading into 2020. It was tough because COVID kind of threw everything um, haywire, and f- so for me, that one of the biggest issues was was censorship. But 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 actually, like a bigger one was just actually getting money in the pockets of American people. So what was interesting is you could you could already see see the split in the Republican Party. So you saw someone like Trump wanting to help people out. He he wanted to do two K stimulus checks and things like that. But then you had Mitch McConnell, the the old GOP, come out and and like absolutely not not be with this. So a lot of for a lot of American people. They feel split because you, you you see this one guy who is fighting for you in the Republican Party, but then the whole party itself is against him and not fighting for your interests. So, you know, it's not popular to say, but it's like, dude, when during that pandemic, a lot of I was interviewing a lot of working class families. They needed that stimulus yeah. check. They needed that money. And instead, we have bailed out Boeing and all these big corporations and we'd never bailed out the American people. So for me. I think the the, the, the the American people just like we're just more like, whoa, who's actually going to fight for me? Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, a lot of people like obviously Trump still has a lot of support. He had like the most votes ever for like a Republican president. He brought in the most black and Latino voters. But there's still a huge portion of this country that does not like him. And they might they they are still, I would say, if you want to say brainwash, whatever, mm-hmm. by that mainstream media. Now, I'm not saying you're brainwashed if, if, if you don't like Trump. It's just it's just like if you don't like Trump. Give me some solid issues. You know, him being mean and racist, that's not really doing it anymore. Like policy point, like what is he doing? So for me, heading into the 2020 election, like for, from policy point, I didn't see anything from the Biden administration. I'm like, what is he doing? And when I would talk to my friends who are more progressive left, they're like, yo, we want a $15 minimum wage. 
uh, universal health care, free college. And I'm like, you know, you're not getting that with, with an establishment Democrat. Right. You actually have a um, you, ha- you have a better chance with Trump. Trump was actually more was more uh, willing to to play the populist role than Biden. Like I said, Trump was an advocate for 2K checks. Either I remember uh, Biden came out and he like he like cut the checks to like 1200 bucks. I'm like, mm-hmm. you guys are already losing money under the Democratic Party. And then when that Georgia Senate race uh, came in, that was huge. And people were counting on that 2K checks. Mm-hmm. And Mitch McConnell came out and said, we're not doing it. And that's where I'm right. There. I was like, you're going to lose that vote. So so leading up, man, it was just crazy. Like I said, because COVID threw everything haywire. I think it was just about getting money back into people's pockets and getting things open. If you ask me now, now that we're in, into 2021, immigration by far, number one issue. Nothing is even close. Immigration. We literally have crisis at the border that just impacts us on national security and it, it hits us on wages and all types of things. A lot of people also think that uh, uh, re- establishment Republicans are against immigration. A lot of these establishment Republicans, for it. they love immigration because uh-huh. it keeps wages down. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They're worried about corporations and, and, and they're, you know, they're globalists. The same ones, like you said, the same ones that sold out those automotive jobs and screwed over Americans, man. And good old Papi Trompas, my Tio Trompas, he was just trying to, like you said, be populist, nationalist. And it was about the jobs and the wages. And he was pissing off both sides of the establishment. But like we said, People hear Trump's name, they just start thinking, oh, he said grab my pussy and all this type of shit. And they lose their shit. Yeah, yeah man. I saw and like and it I, I saw a lot of people who who obviously who vote on the left that when Trump got banned on Twitter, they like celebrated it. Censorship. And I was like, I was like, you guys are actually cheering on mm-hmm. uh big tech corporations. Like you're actually a fascist. Like if you if you support banning speech, you're actually like a, a fascist. So so people need to wake up to that part. I think a lot of progressives are now waking up under the Biden administration that because they didn't get anything that they even asked for. They didn't even get the fifteen dollar minimum wage. Like they thought they were gonna get that in like the stimulus package. Nothing, nothing on healthcare, nothing on college. Like I don't know what actually Biden is is doing. Like no cap, I really don't. He's just he's kind of just there to be there. And 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 until this day, bro, I don't understand the border issue. Like I don't get the political game, bro, of not solving the border issue, man. Like why are they just letting it happen? I, I really, I really don't know. It's what almost like it. it's almost like it's on purpose. You, I like how, how what I said. Like I don't know what he's doing there. He's just kind of there. And even when he is there, honestly, he's not really there. <laughs> he's, he's only there to eat ice cream, bro. He's only he's there to get his little two scoops of ice cream. For the and media, all the reporters are. Oh my God, Mr. President! Today, Mr. President, what flavor? What? <laughs> yeah, today he ordered chocolate chocolate chip. Hey, and Jingle, I hate to say this, but if man, we if we live in a joke society country right now man it's it's insane bro to, to to hear the press uh fonting over a guy like that it's like come on man this is it's a it's a joke of a country and it sucks because then these real issues these real policy points they're not getting told to the american people and then and the american people are actually misinformed when they vote they don't even know what they're voting for one of the biggest issues that i think for the latino side is so for instance on uh, on the english side you have Fox News, but you have a CNN. You know, you have the you have the left and mm. right. They kind of they kind of counterbalance. The huge issue, bro, with the Latino news, it's there's only Univision and Telemundo. That's it. There is there's not even a counter. So the narrative is always one. The narrative is always this one. And that's one one thing that I think bothers me because when I speak to Latino voters, they just kind of vote for Biden just because their mom did it because Jorge Ramos told him to do it, but they don't even know policy wise. And I'm like, bro. You're really traditional. You're actually like against abortion. You know that party supports abortion. Like they're like, oh, I didn't know that. It's like, Ugh. yeah, man, wake wake up. So that's what I think a huge issue, bro, is that like I said, on the other side you got Fox, but you have a CNN. On the Latino side, you have Univision and you have Telemundo. So it's it's always one one narrative, and it's it's it's, it's this or that, and like a huge issue, bro. Like I'm Salvadorian, so a big thing is like Univision, Telemundo are trying to come after the new president Bukele, no Salvador. Like they're trying to make him make him a, a bad name and stuff. Yet. Our co- El Salvador is doing better than ever right now, bro. We're, we're only we're, we're, like if you talk to Salvadorans on the ground, they love this guy. He has like a ninety-eight per, you know uh, percent like um, like they like support him rate. And then so it's it's all these it's all these issues, bro. That like I said, it's just the Latino people are are there. We just needed other lanes, bro. So I think podcasts like yours, hopefully with news like mine. I got I got a great friend. Um, Anthony Cabasa, who's working with El American, they're like they're like a Latino news organization. So I think we need those type of channels to communicate to that message to our, to our people and be like, hey man, we're not here to tell you to vote this way, but like from policy wise, 
I need you to be informed, bro, so you know exactly what's, what's going on. So if you do vote a candidate in, don't be mad when they ship your job to China, bro, because mm-hmm. you voted for it. Yep. So we need, to, we need to wake you up on that. So recently on the podcast, we were talking about uh, the, the Breitbart doctrine, which, you know, Andrew Broadwright said, you know, politics is downstream of culture. And, you know, Chingo being an entertainer and a lot of the people that are on the left being, you know, Hollywood entertainers, big corporations, you know, big tech, they have a way of, of controlling the message, right? For your audience, do you see it being people that are younger asking more questions and getting involved? Or is it more people that are, you know, of your age or older that are, you know, shifting the way that they see things? It's, it's, it's actually interesting, right? I think it's actually kind of all age groups. I think a lot of people, what's going on right now, they're learning a lot, they're waking up, they're adapting. The biggest thing... And I'm, I'm just speaking because being in California, what woke people up, bro, was the lockdown stuff. That actually got people to be like, wait, 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 what the hell is going on? And, and I was interviewing a parent about the school closures, and she told me this quote. I'll never forget it. She says, Jorge, what's going on with these school lockdowns? You know what the Democratic Party is doing? I'm like, what's up? She says, they're now raising the next generation of Republican voters. Mm. These kids will never forget that, bro. These kids will never forget. I would, I'd be talking to a 12-year-old, bro. He's like, I don't trust Newsom. They told me that I was going to go back to school a month ago. Never happened. I was supposed to go to school this week. Never happened. Now I lost prom, my graduation. I was about to have my senior season and, and get scouted out for college. All my dreams are, are crushing. You can feel the anger in the kids, yeah, bro. Yeah, they can't play when sports. When that mom told me yeah. that. Yeah, when that when that mom told me that, I'm like, that's facts. When she said, "Yo, th- this is the next generation of Republican voters," of what's happening. So I think, bro, I think it's kind of happening at uh, at all levels right now. And and at the end of the day, man, I know we, we were, you know, we're talking about censorship and stuff, but we still have these channels now, and we can still, bro, we can still do a lot with what we do. And I think for me, I see it a lot, bro, because it's video. You know, there's no denying the video report. You know, so it's one thing for me to go, you know, make a video selfie, be like, "Hey guys, there's a border crisis." But no, I'm taking you to Texas, and then you're seeing that, and you're like, "Whoa, whoa, okay." I didn't know that these kids were getting sex traffic. I didn't know. I didn't know this was happening. So for me personally, bro, I'm having a lot of Latino Democratic voters who voted for Biden who are now messaging me saying, "I cannot believe he doesn't care about our people," and I'm, I'm never doing it again. So people are waking up, bro. It's a slow mm-hmm. process, but it takes like 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 things like this, like me from the news side. It takes people like Chingo, who's an entertainer, to kind of to kind of get that crowd going, and hopefully, bro, just every, every day. You know, we can we can make a change out here. That's a good point. Like the kids are growing up. I never really thought about that. And it's all over a virus. It's all in the name of our quote unquote safety. And the next thing they're gonna do it over is the climate. They're gonna climate lockdown, motherfuckers. And in my opinion, people not waking up fast enough. <laughs> Because it's just still overwhelmingly like ignorant. I'm sorry to say it. Yeah. Maybe that's just the you know some of the people that follow me. Maybe you have uh, more open-minded followers, uh, Jorge, and I'm jealous. Uh, but <laughs> but like it just seems, it just seems like they like totalitarianism. They like authoritative government all up in their mix, and they like censorship. I mean, even yeah, George, I, I, he, oh, real quick, real quick. Even George Lopez posted. Uh, he was celebrating the censorship of Trump, right? Because, I mean, he's a he's a never Trump or whatever. But it's like, man, how are you going to be a comedian and you're rooting for censorship? Yeah, anyway. yeah dude. Comedians are supposed to be the, the most outspoken free speech people. And you're doing that. Then we have a White, uh, White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, come out and say, oh, if you if you have misinformation, the White House is going to flat. And it's like, wow. She literally came out in the open and said, we are working with Google, Twitter, Facebook, and they're now becoming a big government Man. state actor. They're, they, they're, they're telling us in front of us that yep. they're a fascism regime. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're telling us that. And it's funny to me. It's like, it's like you guys want to talk about uh, open internet in, in, in Cuba. What's going on in our own country? We, you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's the thing that bothers me. And like, also, bro, like even with the Wuhan uh, lab leak story, mm. you know, if a year ago, if you posted it, you're banned, you're done. Now, even Biden is saying that, that that story is credible. So it's just it's 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 uh, insane times that, that we're living in, man. But at the end of the day, whether we're left or right, one thing that I think we could always agree on is we got to we got to fight for that free speech, because I'm always going to fight for, for, for people's free speech. Even if I don't agree with you, obviously, we want you to say what you want to say. And, and it starts off really small, bro, because people doesn't think it can happen to them. They, they do it with Alex. It's mm-hmm. Alex Jones yesterday. Then it's you tomorrow. That's funny. You said that on the last episode. On the last episode, I said, first they came for Alex Jones, then they took off Trump, and now Jen Saki Saki, she's going after the Facebook 12. She said, there's a dozen people who come up with 65% of all this information, and it is in the government's best interest to keep people safe. And next thing you know, like today, I tried to follow one of the people of the uh, Facebook dozen or whatever. 
the disinformation people. And I, I wanted to follow the person. And Instagram's like, hey, uh, you sure you want to do that? You know, make sure you know what credible sources and do you understand how reliable the stuff they post is? And it's like, uh, yeah, I want to follow them. So like you said, man, it's just going to, if we don't start standing up, speaking out, waking people up, fighting back, it's just going to get worse and worse. And we're hearing a lot of reports from like New Zealand, Australia, I mean, Europe, yeah, uh, France, France. Uh, even New York, they have their version of the um, vaccine passport. Theirs is called the, uh, it's like something, the Excelsior, the Excelsior Pass, which means like elite, elitist, right? And, uh, but anyway, I worry, you know, as an entertainer, somebody that, that tours, I am on tour right now, Freedom of Speech Tour. I worry all the time, like, are we going to get locked down again? Is everything that's happening in Europe, are we just four to six weeks behind? Um, what is this regime going to do? That's why I do worry about the election shenanigans, because I feel that this regime has their shoulder to the wheel trying to run America off a cliff. It's like, this might be our only hope, man. Papi Trompas, I need you to come back. Papi Trompas. Or uh, what do you think of uh, DeSantis running in 2024? So what, what I think is, is happening is I think DeSantis is going to do this. I think he's going to wait to see if Trump announces. If Trump announces, DeSantis is going to sit back, you know, let, let him do his thing. Uh, if Trump picks him for VP, I really don't know if DeSantis would accept. It's a 50-50 because like, you could accept it. You could be VP to Trump. And then obviously after VP, the next move for DeSantis is presidency or you could let Trump do his thing. You sit back and still run Florida like a well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. He then jump in after that. So I, I, I think that DeSantis is, is he's waiting to see what Trump what Trump does. I mean, you guys just saw that Trump was just in that in McAllen, Texas. He did like a town hall with Sean Hannity. Mm -hmm. It sounded like it sounds like in this next year or two, he's going to he's going to announce. So I would I would expect the Trump for announce. I don't see um his his uh, VP being Mike Pence. I think Hell no. gonna, you talking about yeah, the traitor or another route. <laughs> And I think Trump, too, I think he learned from his last administration to not have folks in like Jared Kushner and Jared Kushner messed up a lot of a lot of things for that administration. He, he was playing really a huge role in that staff. So I think I think Trump learned some things. But I think, like I said, I think the Santa is going to wait, see where the chips fall. Interesting. Yeah. I heard people say because if he does that, he kind of leaves Florida up, you know, for grabs. And, you that know, suck. Yeah. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, um. You know, we often say, and you have the sports background as well. Do you feel like politics has become the new sports? <laughs> yeah, it, it, honestly, I feel like it has, man. It's like the new, it's, yeah, man, it's like the new sports. It's like, it just took over everything, you know. Like, like like four or five years ago, you know, people, you ask them who they voted for. People were like, just even share to, to, to tell you what political party they, they are now. It's like on their sleeve. Like, I'm team this, I'm team that. And yeah, I mean, I think it's it's more it's more out there. It's more mainstream than ever. And that's why I think I, I made that switch, man, because I could see the audience, you know, go there. And little by little, I'm like, you know what, man, this sports reporting, it's not entertaining anymore. Talking about a halftime scores, it's not as interesting as like immigration or the economy. And <laughs> that's stuff funny. Like that. you, you know, I it's think, funny I, you I say. Think it, I think it's there. It's funny you say uh, when you you can wear your political party on your sleeve. I got the shirt on. Bah, it says Chingo Bling. People know who I voted for. We're having a fucking Damn. shirt that says Chingo Bling on it. Well, that's a crazy statement. I never thought that uh, it would be interpreted that way. But like you said. Like I, sometimes, man, especially if I'm in the airport or if I'm going to be out around, you know, public and stuff, I'll let them know, bam, I'll have the American flag or something. And it's crazy to look at it this way where, oh, this person has an American flag and like some patriotic stuff or whatever. And, oh, this person must be about Second Amendment, free speech, America first, the Constitution, family values. And it's like, why wouldn't you want to be on that team? Yeah. That's what I don't understand. It's like. There's nothing racist or bigot about it. You'd rather be on the purple hair, uh, Sports Illustrated got a dude on the cover now, um, you know, abortions, censorship, just, censorship, and just fascism, and you want big tech telling you every fucking thing. I don't know. To me, the choice is clear. Red pill tamal or die. <laughs> Pick a side and ride. Yo, we, I might have to, if I ever do a show in the future, bro, I might have to call it because I would learn uh, Red Pill Papusa or something. Yeah, Red Pill Papusa, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, today Dude, is, that's funny. today's the official episode, Red Pill Tamales collab with Red Pill Papusa. I like it. <laughs> I like that. I hey, like dudes, that, speaking dude. about sports and how politics is downstream of, of culture and, and sports entertainment, since you used to love sports, do you still love it? And what do you think that, you know, politics has done or that the culture shift has done within sports? 
So, okay, so we all know that, like, obviously sports is going more woke than ever. They did the whole Black Lives Matter thing last year. It's like I was trying to watch the playoffs. Yeah. Got a big Black Lives Matter logo on it. Some of the players change. It's like it's 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 a it's like that fake wokeness. Um, they want to act woke with us, yet they're still doing business with communist China and the Uyghurs, but that's a whole nother thing. So for me, man, I, I, I hate, obviously I hate sports going woke. Now this is not going to be popular to say, but I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, I'm done watching baseball forever. I'm done watching. For me, it's, it's like, dude, at the end of the day, I wouldn't even be doing this if it wasn't for sports. That's still my first love. I still watch it. It's still my, it's still my thing. Now it's not like my heart isn't it how it was a few years ago, but it's still one of those things, bro. It's a, it's a big bond. For me, what I do love is that I'm a, I, we watch a lot of soccer in my family. The good thing is soccer is like one of those sports that hasn't even really touched the wokeness at all. They don't care about it. And for me, you know, soccer is still, it's still a special moment, man, because like me and my dad, we watch it together. We're able to talk. We're Salvadorian. So like, we, you know, the, we, 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 just, we just talked about El Salvador. They played Mexi- on Mexico on Sunday. And we still have that, that bond, bro, still there. So for me, I don't think I'm ever like not going to gonna, gonna watch it. I, it's just, you know, my heart's still there, man. What about the Olympics? You excited about that? Uh, I don't watch too many of the of the of the Olympics. Team USA, that that basketball team, is not even they're not even good. Uh, so no, honestly, bro, the Olympics, I'm not I'm not watching too much. I'm focused on my Lakers, focused on my Raiders and my LA Dodgers. Hey, I'm, hey, are you upset about? Are you one of those people that get real butthurt when I bring up Altuve or the Astros? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that okay. shit hurt people's hearts. To, bro. Hey, bro, bro, let's not let's not do it right now, bro. See, Please. don't bring that shit up, Bless Rob. <laughs> I get DMs still. Hey, man, that was his opinion, not mine. <laughs> I still go to California. I, I, I'm conscious and I'm sensitive to to you know that, <laughs> that climate. You know, I don't stand with cheating. Hey, man, I'll put it to you like that. Hey, what was Latino Heat's uh, catchphrase? Uh, one of them is uh, well, Viva la raza. <laughs> but also, hey, <laughs> lie, cheat, and steal, Latino Heat. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, yeah showing show a lot of a uh, uh, tribute to my boy eddie today shout out how long are you gonna be in florida brother uh literally bro like the, the next hour to actually gotta um i'm a fly to fly to the airport i mean go to the airport bro fly back to cali we're working on a, on a big documentary right now so yeah i'm actually literally bro only like another hour or two here <laughs> oh wow well hey man we'll let you off the hook and i just want to give you props again you do a great job of putting together the story for the viewer and the listener, you know, the narrative of how, I don't know how you do it. It's really hard work um, to be moving around like that, but yet you're getting drone shots. And as I was hanging with this person, then we went to talk to this person. You got to get all these different shots and interviews. So do not stop. You're doing fantastic work. It is, it is crucial to the future of our country, man. Like whether you know it or not, every post everything you're doing it's really really contributing to our kids future so thank you so much yeah man you and anthony uh because we had him on as well on the podcast y'all are my my go-to for a lot of information and if you have other suggestions for us and for our listeners of people like you that are doing your type of work send them our way so we can promote them and, and watch them as well yeah that, that'd be great and i really appreciate you uh guys having me on the, the funny thing about this it's like life comes in full circle, man. I was like 14 years old, bump and chingo bling, man. Like back in back in middle school, it's just crazy, you know. Uh, you know, now we're now we're doing this, so it's just cool, man. Life life comes in full circle. Yeah, you back when you were SL little patriot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you, fellas, having having me on. This is a a blast, and I love content like this. Let's, let's keep pushing it out and waking up our, our our people, man. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, brother. Thanks, brother. Have a good day.